Here at Cocktail Party Physics in Texas, we are getting ready for Thanksgiving. And an important part of our preparations includes salt. Yep, salt. Salt is one of the most ancient of spices. It's mentioned in the Bible over 40 times in every context from food to Lot's wife becoming a pillar of it. And in fact, one of the earliest pharmacology books delineated over 40 different types of salt and medicinal uses for each one. Why all the emphasis on salt? Yeah, salt tastes good, but in the early days, it actually had a much more important function. Salt was able to preserve food. Salt preserves food in a number of different ways. One of the most important is that salt actually draws moisture from the meat. The bacteria that are bad for us, things like salmonella and E. coli, require a warm and wet environment to survive. And so if you salt a piece of meat in a cool enough temperature, it can actually survive for years without going bad. Salt also disrupts the osmotic balance of cells, which causes them to rupture. Sugar does the same thing, which is why we use it in jams and jellies. Salt, as we use it, is sodium and chloride. If you get your salt from the sea, however, you're gonna find that the salt may have something else in it. And salt from the sea could have magnesium, phosphorus, or potassium. It can even have little particles of clays, which is why fleur de sel, a really fancy name for sea salt, often has different colors and even different tastes. If you're like the rest of us, you probably just use regular old plain salt. That's sodium and chlorine. If you look at a salt crystal under an electron microscope, you'll see it's very cubic. And that's different than the sea salt. The sea salt's very rough. It doesn't have a nice crystal structure. Most salt is iodized, and that's done because of the thyroid. Your thyroid needs iodine in order to produce the, the hormones that allow your thyroid to function properly. And that brings us to kosher salt. Now, you might wonder, isn't all salt kosher? And the answer is yes, all salt is kosher. Well, in the kosher tradition, and also in the halal tradition, um, you're not allowed to, to have any blood in the meat. So in order to do that, what you do is you soak the meat and then you put salt all over it. And because blood is primarily made of water, the salt actually draws the blood out of the meat. So the kosher salt has a special shape. It's very irregular. It's a little flatter, it's almost pyramidal. What that means is there's a lot of surface area. A lot of surface area means a lot of places to absorb water. So all salt is kosher. It just happens to be that kosher salt is ideal for the koshering process. You can preserve meat by rubbing it or burying it in salt, but you can also preserve it by soaking it in about a 10% solution of salt and water. That's called a brine. You actually make corned beef by soaking a brisket for about one to three weeks in a cold environment in a brine solution. And then if you take the corned beef out and you smoke it, you've got pastrami. Pickling, on the other hand, uses salt to draw the moisture out of the food initially, but then it preserves the food by putting it into an acid like a vinegar or citrus, for example. In 2001, I found a recipe in a Martha Stewart magazine, and I would never made anything from a Martha Stewart magazine that was bad. So even though this one looked a little odd, I decided to try it. She recommended brining your turkey before you roast it. It was four cups of salt and five cups of sugar, along with a bunch of herbs and spices, like our onion, garlic, leeks, allspice, cloves. So you mix all these things together, you bring them to a boil, and that allows the spices to mix a bit. It also dissolves all the salt and all the sugar. And then you cool it down and you soak the turkey for about 24 hours before you roast it. The secret to brining is osmosis. And osmosis is a process whereby you're trying to even out the concentration of something. So for example, sodium is an important electrolyte in the body. If you have too much sodium in your blood, water molecules will move from inside the cell to outside the cell in order to decrease the concentration of sodium. Osmosis is a really important property for living things. And it turns out the process continues even in dead things, which is why it also makes a really good cooking technique. Here's a water molecule. Fresh meat has a lot of water molecules. If I take my turkey and I surround it with a the brine, there's unequal concentration of sodium inside and outside the bird. So salt is gonna migrate from outside the bird to inside the bird. If that's all that happened, you would think that would give you one really, really salty bird. But of course, that's not the whole story. When you dissolve salt in water, the salt actually turns into ions, positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chlorine ions. Those ions are important because they're electrolytes and they can travel through cell walls. Meat is made of muscle. Each muscle is made up of a bundle of muscle cells. These muscle cells are long and skinny and they have multiple nuclei and they contain myofibrils. The myofibrils are proteins that have been arranged. There's actin and myosin, both of which arrange themselves in very long fibers together by titan, another protein. Muscle is mostly made up of protein. 
Proteins are made up of amino acids, which are tethered together, and they tend to ball up sort of like a ball of yarn or Christmas tree lights if you don't put them away carefully enough. Cooking meat denatures the protein, and by that I mean it actually changes the shape. Instead of being balled up, it starts to unlink and starts to sort of stretch out. Now a protein's function depends on its shape, so having your proteins denatured is in general not a good thing. But for cooking, it's important because it opens up some opportunities for the protein that weren't there when it was balled up. A protein that's balled up can't really make bonds with other molecules. When you denature a protein, you open it up and you give it the opportunity to bond with other molecules that are around. So for example, if you cook an egg white, as you denature the egg white proteins and they get bigger and more linear, then they actually start bonding with each other. And that's why you see a change from a clear gelatinous substance into something that's more white and opaque and rubbery. You can denature proteins in different ways. One way is obviously heat. Another way is changing pH. So if you've ever had ceviche, which is fish that's been soaked in a juice like citrus or something else that's highly acidic, the acid level actually starts cooking the fish. The third way is salt. So when the sodium ions and chlorine ions go into your turkey, the cells sense that there's a higher concentration of sodium outside the cells than there is inside the cells. Water molecules go from inside the cells to outside to try to decrease the amount of sodium. But that effectively increases the sodium concentration inside the cells. And that's what allows the sodium in the cells to start breaking down the proteins in your turkey. Now that doesn't mean that after 24 hours of brining you've got a bird that's cooked or even remotely on the way to being cooked. But you have to think about how a turkey gets dried out on a cellular level. So there's two things. One is the amount of fat. Fat contains water molecules. So something with more fat will be moister than something with less fat. But even without fat, there's plenty of water inside meat. And that water is in one of two places. It's either between the cells, which is called intercellular water, or it's within the cells, which is called intracellular water. Now some water molecules are just sort of wandering around and other water molecules will bond to proteins or other molecules that are hanging around. The amount of water is what determines how moist your meat is going to be. Now meat cooks in stages. In the first stage, you're denaturing the proteins and they're able to bind with any available water. That's good, you're making it moister. At 120 degrees Fahrenheit, the meat enters what's called its first sweat. And that's where the intercellular water, the water between the cells, starts to disappear. At 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the meat enters its second sweat. That's where the cell walls break open and all the contents of the cells, the protein, the water, all come out. You can start losing a lot of moisture there as well. What brining does is it increases the temperature at which the second sweat happens. And so instead of that happening at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, it delays it to 160 or 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's hot enough to actually get the bird cooked thoroughly. So you're essentially delaying the process of losing moisture through brining and voila, you've got a nice juicy turkey for Thanksgiving. Now, a couple warnings. It is really, really important, and I tell you this from experience, that you rinse the turkey really well after the brine. Remember, the only purpose of the salt is to denature the protein, not to give you a really salty bird. So follow the instructions carefully on how long to brine and how much salt to use. Remember I showed you the shapes of the kosher salt and the refined salt? Well, they're different shapes, which means they pack differently. And the refined salt packs a whole lot more efficiently than the kosher salt. What that means is that if you take a tablespoon of kosher salt and a tablespoon of refined salt, they won't weigh the same. Now, taste is proportional to how many salt molecules you have. And how many salt molecules you have is proportional to the weight. That means that a tablespoon of refined salt is gonna be a whole lot saltier than a tablespoon of kosher salt. One final hint, and this one is my own observation. If you think about a turkey, 18, 20 pound turkey with stuffing, this is what a physicist would call an inhomogeneous, irregularly shaped object. If you're calculating heat conduction, you would like to have essentially a spherical homogeneous turkey. Now, barring that, here's a trick that I learned. What I like to do is take the roasting pan and put the stuffing on the bottom of the roasting pan, and then I take a pair of kitchen shears and I cut the backbone out of the turkey and I butterfly the turkey and set it on top of the stuffing. 
And what that does is it changes it from an irregularly shaped big glob into something approximating a, a uniformly thick flat plane. It's a whole lot easier to get heat conduction uniformly in that plane than it was our irregularly shaped blob of a turkey. The other advantage you get is that all those wonderful drippings from the turkey drip down into the stuffing. So you get a lot more stuffing that tastes like it's been cooked within the bird than you would get if you actually just were limited to the cavity of the bird. So those are my hints from Cocktail Party Physics Texas. I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving.